In order for a plant to bloom, it must be cared for, be nurtured as a seed, but you must determine the potential of the seed. Some may view the plant as a weed, an eyesore that strips resources from their garden. Others see a beautiful flower, something worth growing, something that may benefit the future. With its rolling hills and pristine beaches, Block Island is the perfect attraction for those who want an escape to paradise. With its historic Main Street and peaceful aura, many people see Block Island as just a vacation destination. Yet the truth is, Block Island is on the cusp of an energy revolution. Located off the southern coast of Rhode Island, Block Island is in the prime position for offshore wind energy. With a growing need for alternative energy, the state of Rhode Island has capitalized on the abundance of wind near the shores of Block Island by creating the first offshore wind farm in America, the Deepwater Wind Project. The world is at a crossroads. With the last decade being the warmest on record, it has never been more important for governments around the world to take action on finding solutions for climate change. This all starts with the education of the future leaders of our society. The Green School senior class is investigating potential energy solutions to global climate change. Throughout our expedition, Our Place by the Sea, we examined the newly built Block Island wind farm and whether or not it is the best financial, social, and environmental solution. By speaking to a variety of expert speakers and Block Island residents, we were able to account for the many different viewpoints of the wind farm from those in favor to those who believe a different approach should be taken. We started this inquiry process by asking the most basic questions surrounding this technology. Who farms the wind? I think like a lot of people, I have a lot of mixed feelings, a little ambivalence about the wind farm. So I believe it's important that we have a transition to cleaner sources of energy. I think there's a lot of good resources offshore, and I think it's important that the U.S. is at least getting a, dipping a toe in the water, if you will, around offshore wind and seeing that experience and seeing what's happened. I do also feel, you know, if you've been to Block Island and you've walked up the little hill by Southeast Light and you, you are confronted by the wind farms, they're, they're very large, right? It is, a, it is a very big change on the environment. And so there are real impacts. And that's, that's part of what makes it interesting to me is understanding how people perceive those impacts and uh, where those beliefs and opinions come from. That's a really good question because offshore wind turbines, as you know, here in Lock Island, are the very first offshore wind turbines in the whole country. And so this is all brand new for everybody. So we, were, we felt a particular sense of responsibility because it's in our backyard. We were both rooting for it, and, and we're cautious about it as well, and I'll tell you why. But we wanted it to go well because um, really the eyes of the industry and the eyes of the world were looking at this particular project to see how it would go. It's really a template, by the way. This is a pilot program, if you will, for other offshore wind farms to be built in, in, in the country. Now I have my extension cord, so I can plug into the mainland and start drawing power, shut off my engine, stop burning fossil fuels to produce power, and it's just gonna, it's gonna be a win-win for the island, without any doubt, and for this company. The offshore wind farm. Yes. Well, I have opposed the offshore wind farm uh, from its inception and on several different uh, levels. I had written grants from the power company for an undersea cable 
uh, as long ago as 25 years to go from Westerly, Rhode Island to Block Island under the channel. I felt that that was the best application to get power to Block Island as we're on uh, diesel fuel uh, at the current time and generator. I think we're always concerned when you're putting something foreign into something natural on what the impacts of that will be. And I think that we're always very aware of making sure or, or wanting people to make sure that we're not putting um, those things at risk. As far as the wind farm is concerned, I think that I'm all in favor of tr uh, getting energy from natural sources. And I think the wind farm is a wonderful thing. There's a huge lot of wind that keeps hitting my houses. Uh, and uh, uh, it's better put to use this way. Thousands of years ago, glaciers pushed across the planet, creating rolling hills and leaving behind glacial deposits. This activity eventually formed what is now known as Block Island. For the island's first 200 years, its normal condition was isolation. Block Island's first inhabitants were the Manaseans, they created a small community on the island as early as 1300 BC and referred to their island as Manises, which translates to Little Island of Manitou. Here is Lauren Spears speaking about the Manaseans. They had some differences um, because island life causes you to have differences in that um, they did a lot more seal hunting uh, for clothing and materials that we used more deer for on the mainland. They used more seal on Block Island. Um, but in lots of other ways, being a coastal people, they you know, hunted and fished and canoed and, um, and lived off the land. And, and their life ways were based on that. While the island was first sighted by navigator Giovanni de Verrazzano in the early 1500s, European contact was not made with the islanders firsthand until nearly 100 years later. You know, there were wars that happened, particularly once European contact came involved. There was farming, if you will, for gardening and things like that. So there was, you know, life happening. You know, there's families and communities living life, doing their jobs, and then socializing and enjoying each other and having spiritual um, ceremonies and things like that, just as we all do, birth, death, marriage, other kinds of spiritual ceremonies throughout their day. So all of those things are incorporated in your life. The island would later be named after the Dutch voyager who first visited, Adrian Block. Early on in the 1600s, Europeans used Block Island as peaceful trading grounds. However, within these first years of the new century, the Manaseans were attacked by the European settlers. The conflict ended with a scarce population of the land's original people and the ownership of the island transferring to Englishmen. This led to the creation of new plans for the terrain. The construction of new harbors in the following years enabled the growth of the island's fishing industry tremendously. As hotels began emerging on Block Island, New Englanders from the mainland began to take interest in building summer homes there. Tourism soon became a profitable market. Life today on the island sees few year-round residents. By the time winter rolls around, hotels tend to be vacant, and all but half a dozen buildings close for the season. The population drops dramatically, from thousands to barely 1,000. Such extremes make powering Block Island a complicated task. However, Block Island has been making strides throughout the years when it comes to energy usage. So, what exactly has changed over the years? Block Islanders used to burn wood for fuel to heat their homes and light their paths. They were reliant on wood, but did not use it sustainably. The Islanders eventually cut down almost all the trees, leaving them with a need for a new energy source. So how did Block Islanders get their power fix after they cut down all the trees? Whaling. Eventually, society moved past whale power, and so did Block Island. The island moved from whale power to generators. More specifically, diesel generators. Why would such a beautiful, environmentally conscious island use energy as dirty as diesel? Cost. It costs less to transport diesel over to the generators than it does to connect to the mainland power grid. However, 
Block Islanders may pay anywhere from 40 to 50 cents per kilowatt hour during the summer, much more than anywhere on the mainland. The island's power is also relatively spotty, with outages being fairly common outside of the summer months. Clearly, they need a new solution. David Milner, from the Block Island Power Company, has more insight on this. Well, as I said, we, we are not going to be producing power any longer, so the biggest uh, benefit to the whole community is being able to shut down these diesels and not running diesel power. Uh, as far as the economics of it is concerned, at this point, we're going to be almost a wash between where we are right now, which is around 34 cents a kilowatt hour. Big portion of that is the fuel surcharge. Once the fuel surcharge goes away, then we replace that with purchased power. So now we have to buy our power from ISO New England. So. The, the amount that we're paying for fuel right now versus what we're going to be paying for like buying power is going to be almost a wash. So as it stands right now, I don't think there's going to be any reduction to the power bills to the individual people on Block Island. However, if this had been two years ago and we got rid of the fuel surcharge where it was at that point, there would have been a huge savings. That savings has already been there because the price of fuel has dropped so much in the last two years. Block Island is ready for a new chapter in its energy life. With the start of the wind turbines and the new connection to the mainland power grid, the island can finally reduce its carbon footprint. The wind turbines provide a more reliable energy source and connection to the mainland. Now, Block Island doesn't have to rely on diesel energy to power itself. They can enjoy clean energy without the risk of brownouts because of their new connection. At that point, it, it started out, uh, the, the first genesis of the idea was a couple hundred turbines around Block Island. Now we can all look at that, you know, sort of and, and cringe and say, oh, maybe that's not the best way to go. Well, Deepwater Wind came in, there were seven under seven companies all together. Deepwater came in and said, well, let's approach this on a, on a different way, not, not try and splash 200 turbines around Block Island, because that's, you know, difficult, not only logistically, but from a public relations point of view. But we don't want to do it on a large scale initially. We want to start out small, take baby steps, um, and when you're making mistakes, they're not enormous mistakes with, you know, millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in repercussions and, and you know, and, and potentially very catastrophic public relations consequences. But take, take it as a demonstration project, step by step, and work it out so that um, you, you get, uh, you incorporate all the um, stakeholders in a project. And stakeholders can be a very broad um, net that you cast. Um, it's not only uh, the governmental agencies, both state and um, and federal governmental agencies, but also um, stakeholders like uh, uh, the uh, Block Island residents, stakeholders like the fishing industries, stakeholders like the mar maritime activity, other associated maritime activities around there, uh, the sailors, um, uh, stakeholders like the uh, folks who are concerned about the uh, marine mammals, the right whales and so forth. And the state under, undertook what was called the OSAMP plan, the Ocean Special Area Management Plan, which um, in, in, in very short description, to engage with as many stakeholders as possible and, and, and develop what's essentially a zoning map of the ocean. It says, okay, this is where we have transportation lanes for, for large cargo carriers. And this is, these are areas where you know, particularly good fishing. And these are areas that are very sensitive benthic ecology. And these are times of years and different places where there's marine mammal migrations and so forth, and we want to be cautious of that. And these are areas where um, we can, we can uh, utilize our uh, resources, our marine, uh, our marine uh, access um, in such a way to benefit the state and, and the country and the world um, in such a way without, without uh, negatively impacting other uses and, and, and other interests. Um, so it started out as demonstration, and it remains a demonstration project. It's small in scale, but it's uh, si very significant in the broader implications of setting the bar very high for the industry as we move forward. After negotiating and recognizing zoning laws, Deepwater Wind began construction on five wind turbines in late 2014. The wind farm came fully online at the end of 2016, 
about a two-year turnaround from start to finish. The turbines have created over 300 jobs in Rhode Island and lowered the cost of powering Block Island. Even after completion, Deepwater Wind has pledged to stand by their project to ensure that the ecosystem, wildlife, and people who call Rhode Island home are not negatively affected by the turbines. We picked, we picked piles and um, stabbed them into the base sections. The, the piles actually hold the wind turbines in place. They go into the earth and hold it in place. Okay. How many hours did you put into the wind turbines? Um, so it was seven days a week, 12 hours a day for just about three months for me. Do you think that green jobs are better than any other jobs in your business? Um, I don't think they're any better or any worse. Um, it's just another job. Hopefully uh, it'll, it keeps putting guys to work. I mean, I think green jobs are better in the aspect that they're getting away from fossil fuels. But other than that, I think uh, the job is a job. What are the opportunities for jobs that have been created that you are aware of due to these wind farms? There's been the construction of the wind farms themselves have created a vast number of jobs for almost every trade in the construction industry. Um, it put a lot of guys to work in Rhode Island, a lot of guys to work um, on the East Coast and in Jersey. Uh, so hopefully it'll keep, the, you know, the more green energy jobs, the, the more guys will go to work and keep the economy going because that's what it's really all about. How difficult would it be to work in your shoes? Um, I, it is a difficult job. It is a high-stress job. Um, I think, I, I mean, if applied and with the proper training, anybody can do it. Um, but you need to be trained. You need to go to school, you know, and you need to work well in high-stress situations. But it's a great job. Is your line of work dangerous at all? Was the offshore wind turbine construction any more dangerous than any other job that you've taken part in? Um, my line of work is very dangerous. The offshore wind farm was probably the most dangerous job I had been on, but not because it was unsafe, but being out on the ocean is a different animal altogether. Um, there's very, very high winds. There's, there's you have to play the waves, so to speak. Um, everything moves. I mean, you can go overboard. You know, there are many. It's very, very dangerous out there. Um, I would do it again, you know, but uh, it is extremely dangerous out there for sure. You've got to be on your toes every step of the way, for sure. Was the amount of money in both labor and equipment in this project spent well? I feel it was. Um, uh, the equipment was uh, was in good condition. Um, the the money that was spent, like we seemed, the entire job was very efficient. Um, we got done basically from beginning to end, in I think just either two years or just over two years, which is very very good. The job went very well for sure. I think the money was well spent. Are wind turbines built well enough to withstand their 20-year life? Absolutely. Most. The, the, the ones that are out on Block Island are, I don't know if you've been out there, they're massive. They're massive. So um, I think they will, they will stand the test of time, their 20-year limit, for sure. I think so. What's your personal opinion on wind energy or just clean energy? Whatever's better than fossil fuels, man. We gotta get away from fossil fuels for sure. Um, if wind energy is the start of that, then I'm all for it, for sure. Uh, do you have any other comments? Um, no, I don't, it was a great interview. Thank you very much. Brian Wilson will explain what this energy farm can do by the numbers. We're starting out with uh, five turbines, each one six megawatts. Um, so uh, they operate from a range of five, uh, call it six to 56 miles an hour. Um, and they, they have, um, for much of that uh, range, 
they can produce at peak capacity, uh, which is six megawatts. So uh, we're, we're by state law limited to 30 megawatts for this particular project. Uh, so there'll be no additional expansion on block in, in the Block Island wind farm, but there will hopefully be additional wind farms built up and down the Northeast corridor, including our next step, which is Deep Water One. The uh, turbines themselves are set on jacketed structures. Uh, they're based on technology that's been utilized in the Gulf for decades. It's basically four legs that go down into the town to the ocean floor, and then there's pilings that are driven through those legs that go down 200 feet below the um, the seabed to anchor. Um, um, the uh, foundations down. Then the monopiles of the jackets, which you typically associate with um, with wind turbines, are put on there. The nacelle, 450 ton nacelle, is put on top of that, and the 28 ton blades are put on there. The, you know, it's an enormous. Um, these are enormous machines, and they're beautiful, elegant, reductionist engineered machines. But they um, they are the largest commercially available turbines in the world right now. There's other larger ones in in development, but these are the largest that actually are out there working in, in the ocean. Seniors at the Green School traveled around Rhode Island to answer the essential question, who farms the wind? We focused on why people feel the way they do about the wind farm, whether it be positive or negative, and investigated any possible impacts the community may face as a result of the turbines. Block Island is a home for some, a getaway for others. Despite its small size, it's certainly a big part of Rhode Island's culture. So uh, I've lived on Black Island now for about four or five years full time, and uh, it's like a bimodal kind of uh, living. In the summer, it's insane with people, way too many people. But uh, and then in the winter, there's a population of just under a thousand, and it's very quiet and intimate and stormy. And in the summer, it's very noisy and busy and uh, uh, you know, just constant people everywhere. So it's, it's an interesting way to live, but I love Black Island. It's the most beautiful place I've ever been, and I've been all over the world. Um, what are your this is our story. It's not the Providence Journal story. It's not uh, the Westerly Sun's uh, story. This is the Black Island Times story because it's literally right here on the island or just, just three miles off the island. So yes, we did. We did a lot of. We broke a lot of stories um, that uh, were positive for the wind farm uh, project. Uh, some stories that were not so good for the wind farm project in terms of um, delays that happened, uh, closing of a, of an old fishery off the mainland coast that was um, in the in the pathway of the cable that was being laid down. The cable has been a topic of conversation on the on Block Island for decades because we haven't had one and. Uh, we don't have fiber optics. We don't have cable television on Block Island. We have direct TV, things like that. So the cable itself was has been in a topic of conversation for 30 or 40 years. Um, so people have been very favorable to the idea of getting the, the transmission cable, which does include some fiber optics for town use specifically. So that was always a positive aspect of the thing. Um, uh, but now that it's in again, um, and the, the you know the, the electricity will be traveling back and forth, it's just again part of life now. Block Island, Block Island Power would have never been able to afford to put a cable to the mainland. It was just way out of our what we could afford to do out here. We were already one of the highest rates in the country. If we'd have had to pay for the cable and throw it on top of it, it would have been just astronomical. So it never would have happened. Uh, thank God that they decided to put the turbines out here and uh, they got the, all through with all of that because once Deepwater Wind stepped in and got all the permits from the state to do this, they paid for the cable coming, or well, National Grid did, uh, paid for the cable coming out here and now I have my extension cord so I can plug into the mainland and start drawing power, shut off my engine, stop burning fossil fuels to produce power and it's just going to it's going to a win-win for the island uh, without any doubt and for this company so the idea of stabilizing electrical costs um, is is very um, very important to the island we will still continue to pay relatively high um, the costs associated with the as opposed to the mainland just because there's the additional dynamic you know the additional infrastructure out here 
and the distribution system out uh, that we have out here um, and certain uh, things that we have uh, we have to pay for that are above and beyond the mainland but those costs will be lower than historical lot highs and they'll also be stabilized which is a very important thing in addition the fishing industry has received a boost as various marine life have flocked to the turbine bases um, there are cod um, mahi mahi black bass striped bass flocking around these things and you can tell the success of this by looking at the summertime last summer there was normally a, a, a you know up to three or four hundred boats um, off the south side of Block Island much of that fleet moved up in and around the jackets to fish so the recreational fishing there is uh, as 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 blossomed and that's in a very short period of time you know under under two years that we've seen that that sort of development so again naysayers saying that it's going to have negative impacts on on um, the fisheries and, and in fact that's pr proven to be um, unsubstantiated and quite the contrary it's been very successful um, you're going to find a whole lot of folks in 20 years who will be very upset when those artificial reefs are mandated are mandated to be um, to be removed because they will be become part of the they will have become part of the um, the fishing activity the fishing zones around Block Island. As with most every form of renewable energy the environment benefits greatly. Meteorologist Judy Gray from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration focuses on the many benefits wind turbines can bring to Block Island. Um, I really like the idea of the wind farm. I think that um, as a nation, we really have to think about our long-term future and all of the, uh, or most of the resources that we've been using for power generation are limited resources. And in fact, we've gotten to the point where we're fracking for oil, which is ridiculous, and we're causing earthquakes in the Midwest where the fracking is ruining water supplies. And by the way, water is probably our most precious resource as uh, it being essential for life, even more than oil. And uh, so I think that turning to alternative energy sources that uh, work with nature instead of against nature is a really important step for us to take as a nation. Um, so I'm really in favor of it. Uh, think about how little environmental impact or negative environmental impact these wind turbines have, especially offshore like this. They mostly have a positive impact. Um, I, I think we need to continue to assess the impacts on things like uh, migrating birds, but all of the research that has been done on the Block Island wind farm has shown that it's the, the issues are not problems they're just things we need to keep track of and i'm really proud of us i love uh the the saying that we're the smallest town and the smallest nation or smallest smallest town and the smallest state in the nation and yet we're the first ones with an offshore wind farm very proud of it Proud of her state for being the first to support offshore wind turbines in the u.s miss gray is all for yimby yes in my backyard no matter how obstructive wind turbines may be for some people, she only desires a clean method of producing energy to power towns with as little drawbacks as possible. Local resident Chen Yang had this to say about the wind farm. As far as the wind farm is concerned, I think that I'm all in favor of uh, getting energy from natural sources. And I think the wind farm is a wonderful thing. There's a huge lot of wind that keeps hitting my houses, uh, and uh, uh, it's better put to use this way. My house is on a hill, but it doesn't really see the windows. I, ha I don't see anything wrong with it. Uh, I've been to a number of places where there are lots of windmills, and I think that if it's serving a purpose, uh, I, it's, it's wonderful. I, I'm, I have no objections to wind, windmills. But how does the Block Island Power Company feel about this new source of energy? According to the company's vice president and general manager, David Milner, Very, very much in favor of them, and mainly because it gave me my extension cord to the mainland. Uh, my whole, here, I don't care, <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but I don't really care whether the wind turbines ever produce any power. The benefit to this company is that we have a cable to the mainland. 
and it's just going to it's going to a win win for the island uh, without any doubt, and for this company. Uh, just that I really do think this is this is such an exciting project because the, the watching these things be constructed, watching them put in place, watching this whole thing from day one when they started it, and the period of time that it's taken to do this whole thing is just phenomenal. You can't imagine having a project of the size of the, that has gone on to be done in, in the few years that this has been done. I think the coordination of it, the National Grid's coordination, Deep Waters, our own, I think has been uh, really, it's, it's, a, it's a great experience to go through. Now, here is Mary Jane Balzer and what she has to say about the offshore wind farm. Well, I have opposed the offshore wind farm uh, from its inception and on several different uh, levels. I had written grants from the power company for an undersea cable uh, as long ago as 25 years to go from westerly Rhode Island to Block Island under the channel. I felt that that was the best application to get power to Block Island as we're on uh, diesel fuel. Uh, at the current time in generator. It was the most economical, gave us the most bang for the buck, if you will, and got us on the grid, which then if you wished to have green power, you could have asked for it and paid for it. At the time I wrote the first grant, it was $5 million to bring the cable to Block Island 25 years ago. The second time I wrote a grant in 2010, it was $20 million not just to bring the power underground, but also for the voltage regulators on both sides, and to bring it down from the end of the island, the north end of the island, all the way downtown into the power company underground in a waterproof cable. It also included the Fios, 32 pair, and it would have taken down all the poles all the way down, which is the sixth grid of the power company, which is the most dangerous grid because it gets all the wind and the wires snap and the power arcs and it causes great damage to people's homes and find appliances when we have large storms. That would have taken care of several things. It would have given us power to the mainland. It would have given us view shed because all of the poles would have been gone. Transformers would have been on the ground. And it would have also given us a grid that was safer than the others because it's the number one problem on the island, and that's not going to be resolved with the windmill project. Number two, it was very cost effective. Payback was almost instantly, instant. To this point right now today, in order to put that undersea cable into the ground instead of the windmill project that's out there, would have been approximately 30 to $35 million. Now that's not even the interest on that money that we borrowed in order to have the windmills offshore. So my feeling on the project was financially, the cost far outweighs anything Block Island is going to gain. Because our power, I do not believe, will be cheaper. I believe it will be more expensive. And that is the basic reason why I opposed the wind farm to begin with. So with that, uh, do you believe that there are um, any promises made from Deepwater Wind that were, uh, that were never met? I will not tell you that there were promises made, but the, but the information given when the decisions were out there as to whether we would approve it or not approve it locally were not sufficient. For example, when the CRMC came to Block Island before the SAMP plan was approved to put the windmills in the site they were sourced. When one got up to ask a question about financial issues, we are told you could not ask any financial questions in that forum. There was no forum ever held to ask a financial question in. The information given is not complete. For example, the town people, when they voted, and also voted to buy the power company, we're never told, for example, that in one of the studies that was recently completed, there are 250 condemned poles that must be replaced at a cost of two or three million dollars. That's one item. Two, the town accepted the liability of taking out underground tanks, 
total liability for removal of underground tanks, which could have been leaking and could have become a supernova cleanup site. They assumed all that liability without doing any testing environmentally whatsoever. Yeah. Number three, it's a fact that there's leakage into the salt pond as we speak of contaminated material. Now, who do you suppose is going to be responsible for that if they do find in testing in the, in the salt pond? And it is leaking into the pond. And that has been recently, finally spoken about. Now, there are numbers of things. Who's paying for the line maintenance once that power hits the mainland in Narragansett? The national grid owns all the telephone poles. When you run wires on those poles, you pay per pole a maintenance charge. When I wrote my grant to go from Block Island to Westerly, if I went to the Wood River substation to convert the power, it was $900,000 a year for the annual charge. If I went to the Mystic substation, it was 90000 a year because there were, oh, so many less poles to carry that wire on. No one has answered that question, in my, to me, successfully, as to where are all these hidden charges and why has no one asked the questions, been able to ask the questions and get the answers on the table? Oh, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. And if you ask me what they promised, they promised a windmill project that was going to pay a huge amount of money to some French hedge fund. That was the promise that they have on their side, and it is totally, totally a profit-making project for them. We happen to just be a little side project, so to speak, that they had to muddle through in order to get the bigger picture done, which is all about money. It's not about power for Block Island. So, I hope that answers your question on that one. Yeah. Um, so, do you think that these uh, these turbines have affected or will affect the amount of uh, foot traffic on Block Island, and and um, what does that look like for your business? Um, do you uh, do you mean uh, that the fact that the windmills are out there might affect us economically? Or, or, yeah, tourism, it, like in that of, like, regard, it might, it island. might, it might affect the number of people coming to visit the island because they're out there, mm -hmm. and they might be a view shed issue. Yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it very much. Um, personally, I don't think anybody cares about the windmills unless they're in their backyard. Mm -hmm. yeah. For example, everyone in the state is going to pay some 26 cents a kilowatt with an escalating charge each year for those windmills to sit out there. Not one people, one, not one person over there knows that. Why? Because nobody was sent a letter in their electric bill that said, oh, and by the way, when you get those lovely windmills first in the nation out there, you can expect a 26 per kilowatt cent per kilowatt increase in your bill every month of your, the rest of your life till you're in the ground. No, absolutely not. Do I think they care about the windmills? And whether they'll visit or not, absolutely not. They don't care about them now. No one ever cares about anything like that unless it's in their backyard. And it might be something they have to look at. This is the kind of thing that's like putting up a little uh, power pole for uh, 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 a cellular phone, a cellular pole. Unless the pole is in your view shed, then you're not going to say anything about it. Because it's not going to affect you. We live in a country that people only speak up if it affects them. No one is looking at the greater good today. Everyone is only concerned about me, what I see, and how it's going to affect me. So no, I think everybody will get on the boat. Everybody will look like they're out there and say, oh look, there's some windmills and they'll get here. And no, I don't think it'll affect us one bit. It will affect everybody and their property that lives on that side of the island in the, in the big houses that are looking at it because I really can't see anybody paying that kind of money to look at them when before you could look at the ocean all the way to England. I think it might affect the property values of a handful of people on that side of the island. Yes, that's the biggest downside. If we are going to see a real change, everybody has to be on board. Without the support of everyone, from the government to fishermen, from mainlanders to islanders, the Deepwater Wind Project would have never been successful, and the future of wind energy would be at a standstill. Our essential question, who farms the wind, has one answer. 
everybody farms to win. Stakeholders, those who use the energy, and everyone in between all have part in this process. These are the people that make the offshore wind farm possible.